appreciate that, Lee. You the man. I hope you too. Have a good summer and uh, hope you do some drinky, drinky, smoky, smoky as well. <laughs> yeah, if that's what you do in your life. If that's what you do. If not, and it's just protein shakes and Cliff Bars, then do that too. Oh, yeah, baby. What's up? Yo, yo, yo. It's Chris Sims. It's Chris Sims on Button. We're back. It's football season. Good to be back. Olympics in the books. NBC killed that. I enjoyed it. I thought it was awesome. I really did. Our track and field team was great. I mean, I really did the swimming, all of it. It was awesome. But it gave me a longer hiatus. It's the reason Ahmed Fareed's not here today. It'll just be me, solo dolo, here to start off our 2024 football season. But it is good to be back. Hope everybody's good out there. right? I did lots of drinky, drinky, smoky, smoky over the last two months. I, I mean, literally was just detox, retox, detox, retox, detox, retox. So I, was, uh, I need a little structure. It's good to get back into the swing of things. I've been enjoying football the last few weeks, of course. But having got a whole lot of had a, had a whole, whole lot of chances to talk about it so that's what I'm pumped about and glad to be back with everybody I hope everybody is pumped as well um, yeah no I'm in free today just me he'll be back though again he's traveling back from from Paris France right now as most of our company is and dealing with that uh, so I don't know if we're gonna see him Wednesday or we'll see him next week but Pete and I have come through you know with a good rundown for the pod right episode 627 to start the 2024 season we got some ask me anythings out there all right i saw just about everything that's worth of seeing in nfl preseason football in week one right and we're going to hit on a lot of teams and a lot of different scenarios and stories throughout the league now some of the teams who you didn't play a lot of starters players out there whatever you're not going to get talked about i'm sorry you know unless maybe you got a rookie quarterback that was in there and we could talk about him certainly okay but yeah there's a few teams out there hey like the dolphins played a lot of backups all that you're not going to hear a lot about them today there's not there's nothing to talk about right so that's going to be kind of our our one of our themes of this podcast you got to play to get us to talk about you, and uh, we got a lot to talk about. I think one of the first things I want to hit on right off the bat, right? And first off, I got to throw a love to this. I mean, I throw out an ask me anything. My man Pete Demolitis does, and we get a response from Scott Pioli right off the bat, the old GM of the New England Patriots, right? He he just gives me a have a great season, C Sims QB. What up, Scott Pioli? Thanks for saying hi. Hope you're good. Uh, but we got that. But like, we got him the preseason here's some things right off the bat that just week one preseason football man did we have a lot of people playing this weekend a lot of noteworthy hey starters playing and and my big thing with this and I said this to Florio today on PFT I believe it's the Chiefs effect. That's what I'm calling it. And especially you saw it in the AFC. The NFC, a lot of the teams didn't play starters, right? We didn't see the Eagles, Tampa Bay, Detroit, Dallas, San Francisco, the Rams, right? I think really out of the, the upper echelon NFC teams, the only team that I saw that played starters was really the Green Bay Packers. And we saw Jordan Love throw the big touchdown pass. I know they had a number of their defensive starters out there playing as well. So that would be one team that, again, was in the playoffs offs last year in that Super Bowl window in the NFC that did play, right? Most of the NFC for the most part, yeah, it was a lot of, it was a backup weekend. It was it was the twos and the threes. Now the AFC, that wasn't the case. And that's why I call it the Chiefs effect. First off, the Chiefs always play in the first preseason game. They always get their guys out there and he believes in that. He runs a tough training camp and he's one that I think he believes, hey, he wants his team to hit the ground running when it comes week one. Not like, oh, we're still figuring it out here through the month of September. And they've gained great advantage of that. And, and because of that, I think it's trickled down to the rest of the AFC. One, because I think, listen, they look at it and go, wait, the team that's dominating football for the last four or five years, right? Four to the last five Super Bowls, they've won two to the last three, right? The, the, oh, oh with that, that team, they're playing their starters in week one in the preseason. Well, maybe we should copy that. Also, I think with as competitive as the AFC is, right? We got a lot of teams that are in the Super Bowl conversation in the AFC for sure. I mean, you can almost put the whole AFC North in there. I think they all realize, hey, it's going to be slim. It's going to be tight as far as the playoff races, right? We know there's so many good teams. There's more than seven quality playoff football teams, I think, that are in the AFC. And when you really unpack it and look at it. So, yeah, there's going to be some teams left out. And, hey, I think what they're looking at, some of these teams are going, damn, 
well, you know, we're not going to drop a game or two in, 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 in September just because we're getting used to things. And now, oh, wait, we would have had home field advantage, but oh, now the Chiefs got it. Or, oh, wait, we would have been the sixth or seventh seed, but because we are feeling ourselves out in September, all of a sudden, yeah, we're not in the playoffs now, right? You saw, here's the AFC. The only teams that are like, we're talking true Super Bowl contenders that didn't play their starters are the Baltimore Ravens, the Miami Dolphins, and the New York Jets, right? And you could say what you want, how what quality a Super Bowl contender they are, but Buffalo played starters, the Chiefs played the starters, Houston Texans and the Steelers, when they played each other, the starters, right? We saw, uh, I, I just meant the Cincinnati Bengals, Jacksonville, Indianapolis, the Tennessee Titans. I know some of these teams aren't in the Super Bowl window, but my point is, as you saw, the AFC definitely has some urgency, and that's where we're going to start. We'll start with the Kansas City Chiefs and or ask me anything, right? My man at Murphy Info, how big of a deal is the Hollywood Brown injury? It's the Kansas City Chiefs. We know they're really good. It's not a huge deal, but where I think it stinks for us as fans and everybody out there is it, it's going to mess with the formula that I think I was really excited to see from the Chiefs here, right? The Chiefs have been talking about all offseason. They are going to get back to throwing the ball down the field. They are going to be aggressive, down the field, uh, big play pass designs, whatever, Xavier Worthy, Hollywood Brown, right? Couple that with Kelsey and Rasheed Rice working the underneath intermediate routes, and then Pacheco running the ball, right? They got a, a, a scary formula that way. But so, like, is it going to hurt them? I don't look at it and go, oh, man, now they got no Hollywood Brown. You know, they might not be a one seed. Now they'll be a number two seed. No, not not to that capacity. But I think it with, with Hollywood Brown, and I think most likely with this injury, he won't be available for week one. And then you got the Rasheed Rice situation and what happens with that off-the-field incident and the speeding car and all that in Dallas, where you look at it and you go, we could get to week one in Baltimore. I mean, against Baltimore, the Ravens, I'll be there and it might be like oh wow no they kind of got to play two tight end sets and play a different little way here because Hollywood Brown and Rasheed Rice are not available and it's gonna have to be a different offensive attack so again not a big deal Kansas City still amazing we know that but I do think it affects that down the field pass attack that I was ex of course uh, so excited to see from the Kansas City Chiefs but either way the Chiefs Mahomes looked great I thought it was one drive right Rasheed Rice I believe had the drop on third down that would have continued the drive it wasn't the easiest catch, but uh, all in all, they get their feet wet and look pretty damn good. And like I said, I think the Chiefs effect is real throughout the AFC. When my biggest shock of the weekend was turning on the Bengals game. And again, I didn't know who was playing, who was starting, I didn't know, but I just turned on the Bengals game and I go, oh my gosh, Joe Burrow, the offense is starting, right? Zach Taylor, usually a little bit of the like Sean McVay, old school West Coast style of coaching where they don't play their guys in the first preseason game. In fact, they don't want to play their guys a lot in the preseason in general. They usually use what I just talked about earlier as that September, let's feel it out then and we'll get into good football shape and start to come you know, into form late September, early October. I think they know, hey, if they want a home playoff game, if they want to have the Chiefs there in the AFC Championship game, they can't waste time. They're on a mission. And, I, and, and the first thing is from J uh, Jake, Jacob Dem Demion, right? One drive, but did you, but did you see how good Joe Burrow looked? Yeah, I did. First thing that jumped out with me with Joe Burrow watching that, right? One, like we know Joe Burrow's got incredible talent, can throw the football. Mechanics are flawless. I think if you're a young quarterback and you're trying to learn proper ways to stand in the pocket, form, all that, Joe Burrow's the man for that, right? Let alone his physical ability is special. But Joe Burrow, I think the first thing I looked at was, whoa, look at, this, look at Joe Burrow's legs. Joe Burrow was noticeably thicker human being on the field Saturday night as compared to his first few seasons in the NFL. And I think that's because of the injuries. He's put a little more armor on. He still looks every bit as athletic. His arm is awesome. His accuracy, his timing, his rhythm, you know, and of course his patience and being slippery Joe in the pocket I think is up there with anybody, right? But that, that popped to me. And the Bengals in general, like I told you, playing that many starters, seeing that, the offensive lineman out there, got a different look with that O-line. They are big. It's an impressive looking group that's for sure you got to see T Higgins out there I was excited one with the Bengals too Jermaine Burton right the the, the draft pick from uh Alabama 
I think he is going to be a nice addition, and you could see they're getting him some meaningful work because I think they know they're going to have to depend on him to be, you know, help out as being that number three receiver and being another guy that could take pressure off of Higgins or Jamar Chase, right? So that jumped out to me. And then here's one other thing that just jumped out to me. On the defensive side of the ball, right, uh, Bengals talented. They got some young guys. We know last year it's why they kind of fell off a little bit. But I think when you look at the Bengals really at all three levels, you go, man, it's a pretty talented football team. I mean, we know the we know the linebackers are good. The secondary young, but I think extremely talented. So it's like arrow pointing up. You know, D-line, you, you maybe question total depth playmakers there. I think that's one area I kind of look at in my brain. The thing I wanted to get to and that I like, Miles Murphy, first-round pick from two drafts ago, right? I was not a huge fan of him coming out of, out, out of Clemson. Uh, one of my biggest reasons was I did not love his body. I did not think it was defensive end quality, right? The muscle density, the way it looked, right? I've been around a lot of good defensive ends in my life, whether I played for them or growing up around Lawrence Taylor, and I just knew looking at Miles Murphy, I go, I never saw too many good ones that look like that. He changed his body. Good for him. They're going to need him to produce. Uh, they, they need depth on that D-line. They need other pass rushers, and we know they're going through a little bit of a contract thing with Trey Hendrickson. All right. So, so, and look, here we go. Way to go, Petey. Uh, Petey Demolitis coming up clutch. But here's like a little picture of Joe Burrow. You can kind of see the legs are, they're thicker. There's a booty there. He got, he, he went to the drive through this year and went, I need an extra side of Badunga Dunk on there. And they, 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 they made that happen for him. But I think this is going to help Joe Burrow. We know his only problem in his career so far is just being available, staying healthy. Hopefully, this is the year they could do it. I do think the Bengals are a team that are on a mission, you know, to dethrone the Kansas City Chiefs. All right, let's get to it. We know what we came here to do. We're coming here to talk about the quarterbacks, baby. And, yeah, the rookie quarterbacks. I mean, that, that to me was the, 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 the star of the show this weekend. When we talk so much, anybody that listens to Chris Sims on Button and listens to me and Ahmed Fareed or Connor Rogers when he comes in and as a substitute for Ahmed, right, the quarterbacks, the draft this year – the class was phenomenal. Anybody that's listened to me and my thoughts knows that I thought the world of this class, really, other than Drake May, not only the physical talents, but I think it's a class where we really look at it and you go, wow, not only do these guys got talent, but they really know how to play quarterback. It's not just like, oh, he's got a strong arm, but he doesn't see the field well. Or, oh, he runs awesome, but the throwing needs polish. We've had that in years past, right? This is a year in a class where I don't look at it that way. So that's where we're going to start. And right off the bat, we got one from at Stoga Chess, right? What want, want your initial thoughts on rookie QBs and which have performed better, worse than expected? Well, hey, plain and simple, right? This the the guy who stole the show to me this weekend is the number one pick of the draft. Uh, and again, and when you're the number one pick in the draft, everybody, you need to look a certain way, right? There should be buzz coming out of a, out of training camp about your physical ability, and. Now there is definitely going to be buzz more than just training camp. There's been buzz coming out of Chicago, which I think is a positive thing because you hear from players and coaches about the wow factor. And I think you look at any great quarterbacks in football right now, they had that wow factor right away in their first training camp, whether it was Mahomes in Kansas City, Josh Allen in Buffalo, the buzz of veteran players going, whoa, this young kid's got some things that I haven't seen since I've been around here in the NFL. And you hear that from Caleb Williams. How could you not be impressed? Caleb Williams is an absolute freaking natural at playing the quarterback position. It's why I loved him coming out in the draft, that I thought he was in a different tier than everybody else. The one thing you'll notice when you jump off is feel, right, just being a feel in the pocket, patience in the pocket, working in the pocket, never panicking, right? That's what I love. You see Caleb Williams so much like, hey, he looks at the first read. It's not there. He kind of flinches like he might throw it. Then he kind of resets. And a lot of young quarterbacks, that first guy's not open, that second guy's not open. It's, oh, wait, let me put my eyes down. Let me run. Let me do something like that. Caleb Williams is, no, let me hang in there. Let me just check that nobody's bearing down on me, about to hit me, strip sack me, do anything like that. Ooh, I got room. Okay, let me get to my next reads because I can make a throw down the field and change field position or make a big play. And that's what you see. I mean, his first third down throw, you know, oh, great. Pocket collapsing, hangs in there, throws a curl to the left side on a third and 12. 12, a third and 13 to DJ Moore, bam, on the money, first down. The screen pass to DeAndre Swift, how could you not like that? Again, I know it's a screen pass, but the defensive line got through so quickly, he kind of just 
flicked it out of the side of his ear hole and got it done to where DeAndre Swift now can run and make a big play. You know, so it's plays like that. That's a great quarterback play. Again, the ability to, to deliver the ball that way with the perfect touch to where the guy can catch it, right? And then not having a room around you and having people grabbing at you and still getting the play to work, special. Caleb Williams is special. I think anybody that saw those highlights, saw that game, when you see him get the bootleg, run into the right, kind of make a move on the defense and throw a 30-yard laser down the field to Cole Komet, come on. What more needs to be said than that? Caleb Williams is special. You hear that out of Chicago. Chicago is one of those teams that I've been saying all year. Watch out for them. It, it, a lot's going to depend on him and how mature he plays and can he take care of the football and do the right things that are hard for rookies to do at some time. But I think the rest of the team is set up to where Chicago could be a real pain in the butt. And in some ways, I look at them as a almost a playoff caliber team, but that's because I think of Caleb Williams as such a special, special player. He jumped out to me number one. Okay. Now I got another question from at Nordy two one four five. You know, you know which rookie QB seemed like the real deal? Only Caleb, JJ, and Daniels. Okay. No, I will say this. I like all those guys you just talked about right there. And of course, JJ McCarthy had a great game. But I think if you made me rank the rookie quarterback performances from this weekend, Caleb would be one. Right. Not only because a good quarterback play, moving the offense, doing that, but the eye pop factor. I mean, Caleb Williams made a few throws where I just go, listen, that, that's, that's only Mahomes and Josh Allen's making that throw on the run like that to that capacity where you just flick it like that and throw the ball five feet off the ground for 30 yards. Right? So there's special, special attributes that Caleb Williams has. Right? Jaden Daniels, I know he's got a two. Right? And J.J. McCarthy's got a big arm as well. But I thought the second most impressive quarterback of the weekend was Bo Nix, a.k.a. Drew Brees Jr., Right, that's what I look at. I'm just sitting there. I chuckle because I'm like, oh man. I mean, Sean Payton's got Drew Brees, except Bo Nix can run a little bit better than Drew Brees probably could in his prime. And Drew Brees was a damn good athlete, so I'm not, you know, saying that lightly. Right, but like Bo Nix again, I think what impresses me about Bo Nix: quick decision making, really lightning quick release, and and the ability within that lightning quick release to put the ball right where he needs to. Precision passing, and that fits Sean Payton's offense, right? He does. He's the master at coming up with ways to get people open five and eight and ten yards down the field, and he kind of just bleeds you to death. Five and eight. Michael Thomas here, boom, boom, right? That's what he did for the Saints all those years. Then you start to worry about that. Then he draws up or calls up one of his plays where he attacks down the field, and he goes, oh, man, we were worried about Kamara and Michael Thomas and all the five and six yard throws, right? I'm using the old Saints team there just from my example and now they you know we we clamp down to stop that short intermediate pass and they take a shot down the field I really like Bo Nix a lot I thought he played phenomenal not only a great athlete like I said quick decisions and listen you watch the game you watch the game back on NFL pass NFL plus or whatever you'll see I mean hey the, whoever was announcing the the Colts the Colts game there against the Broncos they were thoroughly impressed as well but I feel like we know Caleb Williams is a starter. Bo Nix, hey, there's Jared Stidham there. He did a nice job. I get that, right? But watching that game, it was like, hey, yeah, Jared Stidham's our starter. Get out there. Okay, you did, you did look good. Now let's get to the guy that we really want to start and get him reps so he could be ready week one. So Jared Stidham's a starter right now, but that sure felt like it was a grooming session for Bo Nix to take over. He continues to play like he did uh, yesterday, Sunday that would be, right? He will be the starter week one. I don't think there's any doubt about that, okay? The next thing I will go to here, I think, is, is uh, Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels, one drive, right? Again, with me, I'm just looking, do they look the part? How do they look in their uniform? Are they as big, as thick as I thought they might look? What does the arm look like with the NFL ball and the NFL pads? Is it, is it what I thought in college? Is it popping out of their hand, right? Jaden Daniels doesn't have a ton to talk about, but... Again, looks the part, throwing the ball. He's got great size and presence in the pocket. And because he's so tall and long, he can kind of throw over people with people around him. It's one of the things I liked about him, even with the release that's not necessarily all that high. But, hey, the throw down the right sideline to De'Ami Brown, I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, it was incredible coverage by the New York Jets. But that just tells you, again, Jaden Daniels, and you saw this a lot at LSU, his ability to push the ball down the field on go routes, right, post routes, stuff like that, that's where he thrives. 
described. And I think you'll continue to see that, especially in Washington, because they got some receivers that can stretch the field and do that. Right. So Jaden was impressive. J.J. McCarthy, I think you put him right there in that group. Uh, J.J. McCarthy had the interception. I know that. whoop de doo Not all interceptions are created equal. And I don't give a f- that J.J. McCarthy threw that f- interception. All right. It wasn't like it was like, oh, how could you do that? That was so stupid. What were you looking at? The guy was open. He was on the run. He threw the ball a few feet behind him. Should have led him to the sideline. Probably would have had the completion. He'll get that. That's the things I've seen him do time in and time again. But the J.J. McCarthy situation with the Minnesota Vikings, I think just like the Denver Broncos, it felt like, hey, yes, yeah, Sam Darnold's the starter. Great. Let's get him out there. But let's really get the guy that we want to start to get a lot of work. And J.J. McCarthy not only fits that O'Connell offense with all the deep crossers and the in-cuts, right, and just like Caleb Williams or Bo Nix, I am thoroughly impressed with, their, with J.J. McCarthy's feel in the pocket, right? You know, I know, I know Jaden Daniels can run. I think one area he needs to fix is pocket presence, working the pocket, finding the soft spot, and we'll see as we continue to go if he's gotten better at that. But that, to me, is where J.J. McCarthy, Caleb Williams, and Bo Nix are very special that way and they're feeling the pressure around where's the soft spot where can I step or move to to now where I can gather myself and make a big throw down the field you saw that time and time again with J.J. McCarthy his arm is real right it's a big time arm it's a little bit of a longer release he's going to have to fix that to a degree you saw the athleticism that's real as well there's no doubt about that right and the last thing I think and I think I hit this a little bit breaking these quarterbacks down during the draft he's got to find you know the in-between throw and be a little bit more consistent there right he's a little bit of like throws the fastball a little too much and I think he's got to get in his arsenal the little touch ball over the linebacker's head or the safety down the middle right being able to throw that little banana ball we talk about when you grow up throwing a football that can kind of get up and down not like it's a laser but up and down with a little arc and pace over a defender throw it accurately those are such big important throws that come up consistently in the NFL last guy we're going to hit on in this little group here right Michael Penix we got to go there. Michael Penix right, got a lot of playing time. Look good, certainly, right? I mean, looks great in the uniform. Again, I feel like him and Jaden Daniels a little bit was just a spread offense, and it was very simple. So there wasn't necessarily a ton of quarterback plays to be had. Like, like I'm talking about with Caleb Williams working the pocket and waiting for the second or third guy to come open on a third down and then throwing the ball. That's what I mean by quarterback play. Where I'm going to get sacked. Oh, wait, I can get it out to DeAndre Swift here, right? Oh, nobody's open. Bo Nix runs to the left. Buy some time. Oh, find somebody open down. That's what I'm talking about with quarterback plays. You didn't get to see a ton of that with Michael Penix. It was a little bit like, hey, this is your first read. Boom, he's open. Hey, this guy's going on a go route one-on-one down the sideline. Make it happen. All look good, look controlled. Out of the guys we're talking about here, nobody looked like the game was too big for them, the lights were too bright, anything like that, right? Penix, though, yeah, I do like Penix's look. The one thing I'll say with Penix that I didn't love about it, right, and there's nothing really to pick apart negatively, I just know the ultimate Michael Penix at his ultimate potential, he's got the ability to throw the ball with more pace, more laser laser type of throws. He can get in the habit of his front shoulder as a lefty, his right shoulder, not getting to the target. He, what well, we would say, he swings out of it, pulls out of it too quickly at times to where he doesn't utilize all of his body's power, right, to therefore take advantage of really throwing the ball to its ultimate capacity and speed a mile per hour. But, you know, ultimately still looked really good, did a lot of good things for the Atlanta Falcons, and I think we'll continue to see you know, him get more and more real reps, different type of plays, right? Like, this is the one thing you got to realize, and this is a good question by, by uh, at Nuevo Huevo. With coaches not wanting to reveal too much of the playbook and starters getting limited reps, is it hard to project, project success based on preseason performance? What things do you look for to get a sense of where the rookie QB class is at? I think I explained a little bit of it, right? It's going through reads, it's staying in the pockets, throwing the appropriate balls. The plays are simple. None of these offensive coordinators are looking to go, oh, let me throw out my best play, or oh, it's a game plan specific thing here to screw over this defense in this situation. 
situation. Out of out of everything I saw this weekend, I think the second touchdown pass J.J. McCarthy had, right, it was a short yardage situation. They kind of faked the run up the middle. That was maybe the only one I saw that was kind of like, ooh, you know, they broke out one of their short yardage plays. So you can't overplay some of their runs there. And they took a shot, and the guy was wide open for a touchdown for, for J.J. McCarthy. But the big thing is the look, right, how the ball pops out of their hands, right, you know, are they calm, under pressure, right? And then are they are they going through the process the right way, whether it's at the line of scrimmage or seeing the field uh, when they when they do have to pull the trigger to throw the ball down the field? Rookie cla- rookie QBs though, they stole the show this weekend. And like I said, Caleb Williams, one, Bo Nix, two, right? I would probably put J.J. McCarthy in his performance as three, especially the extensive time and the amount of throws that he made aggressively down the field. Jaden Daniels was really good. It just was limited, right? It was only three throws. You saw his ability to run and do that, right? So that's kind of, And then Michael Penix. I would kind of rank them in that order. But I do love Jaden Daniels and Bo Nix are going to bring an element to those two offenses of the quarterback run game design. Right, Sean Payton's going to be able to not only call Drew Brees type plays for Bo Nix, he's going to be able to call a few Taysom Hill type plays to run around the edge and keep people honest that way. That's what I'm excited about for sure. Um, all right, well, we've got some more questions in the Broncos and Vikings QBs here. Okay, at Plug and Play 16, what's up, dude? As a regular, hey Chris, hope you enjoyed your enjoyed your summer. Pump, the gang is back. The gang is not back. You know, they ditched me, okay, on the first day back of school here. But we will be back. All right, I, you heard – You heard. he wants to know about Bo Nix's debut with the Bronco. The kid can play four to five scoring drives, right, 21 dropbacks, zero sacks, all of that. And August 12th is his birthday. So happy birthday, Plug and Play 16. What's up, man? Way to go. I don't know how old you are, but happy birthday. All right, but you heard my st- stuff on Bo Nix. I love it. I expect him to be the starter sooner rather than later. I kind of would be shocked if he's not to start week one. I really would be. I think he's that mature. He's ready to play the position. He's ready to go. At Rodrigo Barbosa, glad to have you back. Thanks, homie. What did you think of J.J. McCarthy's performance? You know it. I heard it. I got there. Sorry. I'm not a great host, as we can tell, and I've kind of talked about things that were already on the rundown, right? And you see this. The I got a similar question to, at JDB45, and he wants to know about the Broncos-Vikings quarterback situation. And like I said, right, how long will Darnold be able to keep the starting role? Can Zach Wilson beat out Stidham for the backup spot? Okay, I don't think it'll be that long for Darnold to be this in the starting role. I don't. Again, you make a trade to get into the top ten to draft a quarterback who just won the national championship, never loses in high school, never loses in college, right? Has all the NFL pedigree you need. You've seen him play in big games. I would just go unless he's shit in the bed and pissing down his leg during practice. He he's a starter. Let's go. Let's get them out there. I expect that to happen. And I kind of have the same feeling uh, for Bo Nix. Now, as far as Zach Wilson and, and Jared Stidham, I don't know. I think Zach Wilson will probably have to do something special and, and Jared Stidham would have to, you know, have to do some bad, dumb stuff to lose that backup spot and go from, oh, I'm the starter to the third, the third position on the depth chart. Right. But again, you get the feel Minnesota, Denver, Hey, yeah, Stidham, Darnold, yeah, you guys look good, but we got new toys here, and we want to get them in there and get their experience, and it certainly feels like it's trending that way. Now, to me, to the weirdest thing of the weekend, of all the quarterback situations, right, to me and Pete Dimelitis and Matt Casey, you know, my bosses here at NBC, producers, directors, whatever, they will tell you that was something I text the group almost instantly. I believe that was Thursday night, right? I just thought the Drake May situation, anybody knows me, I have my questions about him. I see some physical talent and potential. I know that. But everybody knows that I'm a little bit down on Drake May, the inconsistencies. He needs work. He needs polish. There's mechanical issues. There's not seeing the field that well. You know, there's messed up footwork in the pocket and unnecessary movement in the pocket, right? So I got a question here from at Drew Juarez. Do you think having Joe Milton behind Drake May will have a chance of affecting Drake's confidence? Can't imagine it being easy to see another rookie with the arm talent Joe has on a daily basis in your rear view. Or do you think his draft position makes him feel comfortable? Well, both. I think both can be true here. His draft position makes him feel comfortable. He knows he's the man and they're invested in him and want it to work. 
But the other things that you brought up, Drew, they're real. I mean, yeah, does it put more pressure on them than the fact that, oh, wait, the quarterback that we drafted in the sixth round, oh, he's, he's, he's bigger than me, oh, he's faster than me, oh, his arm is, bigger, is, is stronger than mine? Yeah, that adds more pressure to the whole situation with Drake May. But I just thought the whole thing was peculiar in general. All right, We know Jacoby Brissett's going to start. He starts. But Drake May, who we know needs work, we just talked about all these rookie quarterbacks who got work, right, with Caleb Williams and, and Jaden Daniels getting the least of the work, and why? Because those teams already know they're the starters and their man, and they don't need to see a whole lot. But to throw Drake May in there, right, for one drive, come in second, right, after Jacoby Brissett, the way they did it, okay, the way they did it, in my experience in football, whether it was me playing, my dad playing, and of course following it like a madman ever since I got done you know, playing in the league, that to me and the way they positioned the quarterback situation on Thursday night in New England, me felt like, let's get him out there, okay? Let's show everybody, oh yeah, hey, he's our backup, but let's not let him stay out there too long because people might start to see the flaws that we're seeing in training camp. Right? That's what it felt like. I might be wrong. I don't know. Right? I know a lot of things in football, but that was very peculiar. Wait, our third pick in the draft, right? the next guy in our franchise, the guy that we know needs work, we're not going to give him work in preseason game number one? That, to me, would be a red light right? of like, ooh, we're not sure about what he'll do out here. He might throw the ball inaccurate and do some bad things, and we don't want to hear it, so let's just get him in and get him out it, it, because th that doesn't make sense. And what I saw from Drake May, hey, it's hard to tell. It was a little rainy there, right? He threw a screen pass. He threw a swing pass to the back out of the backfield, right? And he threw a curl route to the right that was off target and had some of the mechanical issues that I don't like about Drake May. Segmented throws, not in rhythm, not natural looking. But in general, I thought that situation was very weird. Again, third pick of the draft, keys to the franchise. We're not going to give him much work. We're going to give more work to the guy in the sixth round, Joe Milton, and preseason game number one. Kind of makes no sense to me. And then, of course, they're in the danger of, back to what our man Drew Juarez said, of, yeah, Joe Milton, as we've heard throughout training camp and as we heard throughout OTAs, he opens up eyes. He does. It might not be consistent or polished either, but the physical ability is, is great enough to where people are buzzing about it, and that puts more pressure on Drake May. I found that situation to be very peculiar. You will see what they do in week two. Hopefully he plays more and we can evaluate him even more as we go along. But, uh, again, in NFL world, I think that's odd. I really do. At Real Goat MLT12, all right, for Pat fans like me who are upset about missing out on iLuke, how long will it be until we get uh, how long will it be until we start getting top 10 receivers via trade free agency again to boost the development of Drake May? Considering our rough history drafting and develop wide receivers on our own. Yeah, I hear you. Hey, a lot of those guys are gone, so maybe it'll be a new regime up there. You'll look at receivers in a different way. Hey, Ayuk, the situation's weird. You know, he tells the 49ers he wants to be traded and he wants to do this, all this. And by all due accounts, it sounds the Patriots had a trade ready for him. We're ready to pay him. The Cleveland Browns are ready to pay him. And it sounds like giving back Amari Cooper. But he doesn't want to play there. So he asked for a trade, and now he's telling him, oh, you know, not a trade not good enough. I want to go where I want to go. So a little bit weird, but yeah, I don't think uh, at Real Goat MLT 12, I don't think the time of big time free agent wide receivers wanting to go to New England, right? Uh, I don't think that's, you know, around the corner. It's going to take a, a few years. One, it's going to take, yes, some success from the football team, as you know, but and then it's going to take what after that? We know Drake May to do some positive things for people to then see it, a.k.a. the receivers who are free agents out there, to go, ooh, Oh, wait, this Drake May, he's, he's got something to him. I want to go there. I, I want to go play with him, right? And we've seen that throughout the NFL with really good quarterbacks. I mean, look, C.J. Stroud, he's already got that. We know Burrow's got that. Mahomes, Josh Allen. I mean, it's every year when there's a free agent 
wide receiver out there to be had, we always place them with Buffalo or Kansas City because who wouldn't want to go play with Mahomes, right? That's part of it. But I don't think uh, New England's in that right now, and they're going to have to show that they can win and he can play at a high level, I think, before you start to uh, think that big-time receiver is going to want to come there and play. All right, more on the 49ers and Brandon Ayuk, okay? Have you heard – all right, and this is from Beeson512. Have you heard any crumbs on Ayuk? What's your take on this situation? All right. Well, I've heard crumbs. I mean, yeah. I mean, again, when you're given a, a the 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 you know the get out of jail free card to call teams, your agent can call teams, talk, trade, do all that. You know, there's plenty of information and crumbs to be heard out there in the NFL. That's what I I that's how I found out about the Cleveland situation. Heard from some people throughout the NFL about what was going on there, right? The Ayuk situation is weird, okay? I can't imagine my buddy Kyle Shanahan likes it very much. One, I mean, you know, I, I feel like Shanahan would rather, you know, almost like Nick Bosa or what Trent Williams are doing. If you don't have a contract, you're not happy, don't be there. Don't be here and just hanging out in the sidelines and be a distraction. And, hey, our team knows you want to be traded, yet they're like we tried to trade you and you said no and poo-pooed the whole thing, right? So I can't imagine that he's going to be looked favorably through teammates in that way because he's kind of holding the team hostage and they gave him what he wants and he didn't want it. And by all due accounts, I mean, it sounds like Pittsburgh and he's trying to set up – the Pittsburgh Steelers trade market there. I thought the Washington Commanders would be in it, but from everything I know, New England, Cleveland, were willing to pay him the kind of money he wanted to be paid. What we know with Ayuk is that his original asking price, right, was significantly lower than what it is right now. You know, I think with the, with the Amon Ross St. Brown and the A.J. Brown deals, that made Ayuk and his camp go back to the drawing board and go, wait, wait, I know we were asking for this, but now we want that. And that certainly made things harder on the 49ers. There's no doubt about that. And I think the other problem with this situation, and I talked about this with Florio a little today too, is knowing my buddy Shanahan, okay, I can't imagine he's just going to trade Brandon Ayuk and then go, oh, we're good. We're good at receiver. I know I drafted Ricky Pearsall. And don't worry. We don't need anybody else. One, that offense – there in, in San Francisco is is not easy, right? There's a lot of rules. There's a lot to be known. It's complicated. That's why Shanahan's awesome. I mean, they do a lot. It's a lot to think that a rookie can go in there, and you haven't seen a lot of rookie wide receivers in Shanahan's history come in and just tear it apart because I think, yeah, there's a lot of nuance and rules and reading coverages on the run and things you have to learn that way that just college receivers aren't used to. I can't imagine my buddy Shanahan being comfortable in week one going, yeah, we'll ride with Debo Samuel and Ricky Pearsall against that Jets defense. Yeah, I'll feel good with Ricky Pearsall lined up you know, across from Sauce Gardner in week one when we got to win a football game. I can't imagine. And that's the other part of this that you're hearing through people in the NFL, that not only are the 49ers we know are trying to trade Ayuk or they've given the Ayuk permission to seek a trade, but I think part of this whole situation and where they're at is they need a receiver back or they want a receiver back, right? Anything you listen to in the Cleveland thing, the Cleveland trade was there. Cleveland was going to pay pay Ayuk, and it sounds like the 49ers are going to get Amari Cooper back, right? So there, that I think that in itself kind of tells you where their mind is at, right? And with a Super Bowl team, yeah, I can imagine my buddy Shanahan doesn't want a rookie receiver being the number two target on the offense right off the bat, starting the season off, tough schedule, whatever else. So, yeah, they're trying to figure something out there. Now, the thing with the Steelers, and it seems to be the team where Ayuk wants to go, and I understand that, the Steelers need a wide receiver. We know that. There's definitely need somebody else to go along with George Pickens. I know they got Van, uh, Van Jefferson and a few other people, but no guy that I think you can hang your hat on and go, wait, wait, we feel really comfortable about our duo right now, right? So I think that's where it's different. What in the perfect world, you'd love to have George Pickens, Brandon Ayuk, and then Van Jefferson's your third receiver, or Roman Wilson from Michigan's your third receiver, something like that. That's the perfect world. But with this situation specifically, the Steelers don't have anybody they can trade back that the 49ers are going to be like, here's Ayuk, now give us somebody that can play for our team because we still need a receiver. 
I don't think so. And that's where that's not going to happen from the Steelers. And, and Florio brought up a b- good point today. I think they're probably going to have to find another team. If they do trade Ayuk to the Steelers, they might have to find another third-party team to go, wait, now we would like to you anybody in business for trading us one of your receivers. And it might be two separate trades here when it's all said and done instead of probably what they want is to trade Ayuk somewhere where they know they can get somebody back. That's where I thought Washington commanders might happen. Adam Peters, we know, right, came from San Francisco. We know Ayuk and Jaden Daniels have a relationship. And I thought, well, maybe they'll trade back Terry McLaurin or, or a Jahan Dotson or something like that to where it can kind of fit both teams. Uh, but I don't know where we go. We'll see where it goes from there. More troubled by the Ayuk situation than Trent Williams. Trent Williams has a history with Shanahan. He was in Washington with Shanahan. That's his guy. And I don't think – you know, Trent Williams is looking to, you know, get a new six-year deal or anything like that. I, I, I would think that with Trent Williams in that situation, a little splash of money on the pot, right, a little extra money, maybe guaranteeing some, some part of the contract that's not guaranteed for the last few years here, something like that will get it done. But I think the IUC situation is certainly more concerning, annoying, whatever, disruptive to the 49ers than, than the Trent Williams situation. All right, let's hit a – we hit the 49ers, right? We are talking about the Steelers, the trade process there hit on the Steelers QBs a little bit all right my man uh, uh Steelers fanatics 93 is Russell Wilson good enough to get a ring out of or should the Steelers bet hard on talent upside of what Justin Fields can be yes like Russell Wilson's good enough to get a ring out of now there's a caveat to that right do I think Russell Wilson's good enough to get you that Super Bowl If you have to rely on Russell Wilson to throw the ball 41 times a game and take you on consistent drives and surgically destroy you week in, week out, drive after drive, no, I don't think Russell Wilson's capable of doing that and taking you to the Super Bowl. But within the way I think the Steelers want to play and the Mike Tomlin style of football, yeah, I think Russell Wilson can take you there. Right. There's still a lot of good in Russell Wilson's game. I think the big thing for Russell Wilson, like we talked about so much, where it was just sour in Denver, is he couldn't handle the full extent of Sean Payton's offense. And what's the point of having Sean Payton and his nine million plays and checks and everything he does if he can't have a quarterback that can take the Sean Payton plays and checks and nine million things he does out on the field and 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 you know let the offense use that to his advantage? Right. That's where Bo Nix is going to be great. I think Bo Nix is that kind of quarterback quarterback to go, wait, Sean, give me all these tricks and these tricks will help me and I'll help you and it'll all help the team, right? Russell Wilson is a little bit like Justin Fields and the fact of it's hard the last few years to find games with a lot of consistent drives of surgicality, great quarterback decisions, right? And just play after play, drive after drive of tearing defenses up like we see some of the great quarterbacks do. It's a collection of plays more times than not. It's, ooh, oh, big throw by Russell. Oh, two plays later they get in the end zone. But I'm talking about those drives of, hey, 10-play drives, seven of them were passes. It was six or seven pass and a few runs sprinkled in and all of that. That's where Justin Fields and Russell Wilson have not thrived. And with Justin Fields, who played – you know, significantly the other night and did some good things. There's no doubt about it. That was certainly the thing that jumped out to me when I watched the quarterback rankings or did when watch back the quarterbacks doing my rankings. There is just collection of plays. That's the big thing. And we heard Matt Eberflus and Ryan Poles at the NFL Combine when they talked to Florio and I. They were I think that was that jumped out to me. They talked about they wanted a quarterback where if they had a throw, they felt like they could rely on that quarterback to throw. And they don't, yeah, the defense is having a bad day. Our run game's not working. Oh, can the quarterback bring us to the promised land and, you know, take care of us on the day we're not playing our best football, right? I don't think they felt like they had that with Justin Fields. They brought up the two minute drill and being able to do that at the end of the first half, at the end of the football games. And those are things when you look back at Justin Fields that, yeah, he's not thrived in those. Nor or did Chicago ever feel comfortable to really just hand him the keys of the offense and go, hey, it's your show, do it? They managed him to a degree. And uh, and where I think it fits in Pittsburgh is 
They want to manage the quarterbacks in Pittsburgh. They're not trying to make it like it's Mahomes and Josh Allen and you just got free range and do whatever you want and we're going to throw the ball everywhere all over the field. That's not what they want. And that's where I say you can still get a ring out of Russell Wilson because Mike Tomlin's still going to go, no, 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 hey, we're going to run the damn ball. And I think for the first time in a while, Pittsburgh should be able to run the ball this year with the offensive line and the running back situation. I think it's the first year in a while the defense has a chance to be, like, dominant. I know they can make plays. They've caused turnovers. They do all that stuff. But I think this is a year where I look at it and go, they might be able to be a top five, top six defense and still create turnovers and do that type of stuff. So within that mold, that's where I like it. But Russell Wilson's at a huge disadvantage right now. We know that. I mean, it's a huge year for him, and the fact that he's not getting to play and practice and do all that, that stinks for him. Justin Fields did a good job the other night. There's no doubt about that, right? He's smooth and all that. Uh, I mean, Mike Tomlin's right. The fumble snaps and all that. That kind of stunk and put a damper on the whole performance, but he did good things, you know? Simple. I think it was simple and what they did on the offensive side. They weren't trying to show too much, but he looked smooth throwing the football, and I like that. The one thing I'll say about Justin Fields, he throws the ball nice and smooth, but there's nothing eye-popping about it. And I don't know if he can make consistently game-changing throws throughout a season that can put an offense over the top. That would be my big thing. I know he can make the runs and do all that. And maybe they can find a way to play a game with Justin Fields where they run the ball, he runs the ball, and they can find ways to create big plays down the field and him throw the ball that way. That could be cool, certainly. And I think that could be a recipe for success, but we'll see where it goes. I do think it's a real competition out there in Pittsburgh, but I still think Russell Wilson has the advantage. And I think Mike Tomlin said that this week just because, again, I think he is more capable – of probably moving the offense in the passing game on a consistent basis than Justin Fields is. That's at least my opinion, especially studying the quarterbacks the way I do, and I think you guys all know I, I study them pretty hard. All right, here's another little theme that I want to hit on. Scary backup situations, okay? Scary, scary, scary. I got a few that pop up to me this weekend that I think are a little scary, all right? I'm going to go off and I'll kind of unpack them as we go here, right? The Jets quarterback situation, the Lions situation, the Rams, why Jimmy Garoppolo is suspended for the first six games on PEDs. That's scary, right? And the Cowboys to a degree. I'm not going to say the Cowboys and the Chiefs is not scary. I just want to see a little bit more and I'm not sure where it's going to go. Right, Carson Wentz, he 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 did some good things in the game the other night. Man, he looks big and he does look a little out of shape to me. All right, but all in all, you know, it, it's interesting. He's their backup. I think if there's one guy that can get Carson Wentz, you know, believing himself and getting the team to believe in him a little bit, it's Andy Reid. And of course, we know that Patrick Mahomes is not going to be threatened by him at all. But I just think that's an interesting one. The Cowboys one is interesting because of this. Right, first off, I want to go. Cooper Rush ain't a bad backup. I mean, it, I mean, it, two years ago he had a play. They went what four and one, three and one, something like that with him at quarterback. He's not horrible, certainly. I mean, he can run the offense. He can make some plays down the field. He's smart. He knows how to play the game. But they traded for Trey Lance. They want Trey Lance to be the backup. It seems like, especially watching that game yesterday or last night, right against the Los Angeles Rams. So. Yeah, that, that situation there is odd in the fact that, hey, I think Cooper Rush is a pretty solid b- backup. I know Trey Lance is sexier and probably has a stronger arm and is faster, but what I saw from Trey Lance in 25 for 41 and 188 yards the other night is still the same things that I worried about with Trey Lance when he was with the 49ers or in North Dakota, right? The throwing is not smooth. It's still not natural. Right? Go back, anybody out there. Watch a lot of the throws. I know there's some pep on the ball. I like that. But the ball's all over the place, even on completions. I mean, yeah, it's complete down the middle, but the guy had to jump up seven feet in the air and stretch his arms out or go to the ground or turn his body and stop, whatever there. Again, to me, just looks more like a great athlete than a guy that can really play quarterback, and that's where I just question that. I'm not going to say that Dallas situation is scary, but I do wonder what's going on there. And... Yeah, I do wonder if they make Trey Lance the starter. Can he consistently move that offense on a game-to-game basis if he's got to play two or three games? I don't know. I question that. All right? The Rams, you heard me bring that up, and I'll stay on that because we're talking to Cowboys-Rams anyways. Stetson Bennett? I mean, I'd be shitting my pants if I was Sean McVay and I had to, and I had to start the season as Stetson Bennett as my backup quarterback. I'm sorry. That's what I, I would. 
You know, hey, Matthew Stafford, we know, is getting up there in age. He's been injured uh, quite a bunch in his career. You got a team in the Rams that I would say, you know, I, I would say is one of the Super Bowl teams in the a NFC. I'm not going to say they're up there with the 49ers or, you know, the Eagles or maybe the Detroit Lions, but I think I, or the Green Bay Packers, but I think I'd still put them in that conversation, right? I mean, they stood there toe to toe with the Lions last year in the wild card game. And, I mean, could have won the football game. I think they're that caliber of a team. That would scare me. The first six weeks, man, Matthew Stafford got hurt week one and had to miss a few weeks, and you got to go with Stetson Bennett. I'd be scared to death. Stetson Bennett, you know, I know he did well at Georgia. He's got a little charisma and pizzazz about him, certainly, right? But he's undersized. He doesn't have a big arm. And the interceptions in the game the other night, I know it's preseason and you're going to look a little rusty and not be your best, but – all four of the interceptions were horrible. I mean, they're horrible. It's horrible looking, horrible decisions, like what the hell are you looking at? What are you thinking type of throws, right? That would, I guarantee Sean McVay is a little worried about that situation today. So they'll continue to battle there and all that, but going to be interesting to see where that goes. And, yeah, I've definitely got my antennas up a little bit of that with Garoppolo being suspended for those first six weeks. Now, the other two I brought up, the Lions, I you know, they're a Super Bowl team. We know that. I might pick the Lions to go to the Super Bowl. I mean, that's that's what I'm thinking about. I mean, we know that. They're they're that type of they're they got it all. What don't they got? Right? But this is one situation where I'd be a little scared. I know Jared Goff has had a you know, for his most part of his career has stayed healthy. He's tough SOB. There's no doubt about that. But Nate Sutfield is your backup? Hmm. I don't know if I would love that if I'm a Detroit Lions football fan or if I was working in that front office there. I think that they really thought maybe Hendon Hooker would be a little further along than what he is and maybe that they thought he could be a viable backup, but maybe he can, right? You know, I know they spoke pretty well about him early on in training camp, but I know, you know, he didn't necessarily impress people at Giants training camp last week when they had some of the joint practices and all that. But we'll see. I know he, you know he didn't get to play a whole lot last year. He was battling with an injury and coming off that ACL. You know, he's, he is an athlete. We saw that in the Giants preseason game Thursday night. He can certainly run and get yards like that. He got a little dinged up. He's got to learn how to protect himself, right? But, yeah, I, I got to see him play more in decisions and what type of throws and what his arm looks like and all that. But to me, that's a little bit of a dicey situation uh, as far as the backup quarterback situation for a Super Bowl team in the Detroit Lions. And then the last one is the Jets. Yeah, Aaron Rodgers has been hurt. A decent amount the last two years. I missed all last year. He was hurt the year before that in Green Bay with the thumb and some of that, right? His play, again, is not, in my opinion, up to Aaron Rodgers' standards his last year in Green Bay. We know that too. And I think even the year before that, you know, when they lost to the 49ers in the divisional game at home as the number one seed, I would say that wasn't up to my standards. Yeah, it was really good. But Aaron Rodgers still has the ability to, I think, to, to take over games with his arms and his physical ability. And he plays the game too close to the vest, in my opinion. And that's just not the way you win the Super Bowl in the NFL right now. Not with some of these quarterbacks and teams we got. You got to be aggressive. You got to make plays. You got to do it that way. Rodgers, his age, being backed up by Tyrod Taylor, yeah, that scares me. Tyrod Taylor is the most hurt backup quarterback ever. I mean, he's always hurt. He gets hurt every time he's in there. And now he's backing up a guy that's been hurt a lot the last two years and is up there in age. That would scare me a little bit for a team where I'd go, the roster is Super Bowl caliber with the New York Jets, right? So that that's where we'll see where that goes. But those are scary backup QB situations for me in the NFL, you know, that I think were uh, worth bringing up, okay? All right, little stuff from, uh, from Super Bowl Nito. With the implications that the new kickoff rule is going to drastically change the game and create amazing plays, do you think the NFL will ever have an annual special teams player team award? That's a good one. I, first off, I will say, I love the new kickoff. I do. I think it's going to be awesome. I think they do have to um, make it a little more streamlined as far as touchback at the 20, 
right? If you don't kick it in the air in the in the right spot or whatever else, then the offense gets the ball at the 35 yard line. I think that's something that's got to be hashed out, and I wish they would make it the 35 to incentivize the team kicking the ball to kick it in that area so we see the returns. But we saw some exciting plays. And what I think as we're going to continue here is we're going to see more and more exciting plays. I think we're going to see special teams coaches continue to be creative with blocking schemes and all that. And I think as we go on here a little bit, I really think the kicker's ability to kind of hit the pitching wedge, sand wedge, into little spots of the landing area between you know the 20-yard line and the goal line is going to be a real weapon. If you can place the ball you know, on the numbers at the 9-yard the line right over there and make it to where, oh, gosh, now we're scrambling over there and we don't have blockers in front of them, and, oh, boom, we get tackled and we got the ball at the 15-yard line, that could be a real advantage, let alone we know if you got a good returner and a good creative special teams coach, you might be able to have some awesome returns. So I think it's something to watch out for, but I really enjoyed the new kickoff rule. And I think at Super Bowl, Nito, you're on to something. And if it becomes a thing where there's enough consistency in this play and we're seeing returns every game, that, yeah, I think we will have an annual special teams player award because this has a chance to be for the first time in a while we always talk about three phases of the game where you can go wait the kick return can be something here that really you know helps a football team or is a disadvantage to a football team or oh this team lost two games this year because they couldn't figure out how to cover off cover the damn kickoff right I think there is going to be some advantage advantages to be to be had with the new kickoff rule I do like it all right uh quick hitters here Texans at Harrington, 5-4, five, 5-2-4. Four, five, four. Do you believe the hype around the Texans? Yes, I do believe the hype around the Texans. And I think the Texans believe the hype around the Texans. My only problem and the question I question with the Texans is, as my old high school coach Mike Miello in his Jersey accent used to say, I hope they're not too busy reading their press clippings and, and, and all this good talk about them, right? That's what I worried about. You know, C.J. Stroud, all the podcasts, right, kind of puffing your chest out. Hey, we're, we're back. We're the Houston Texans. We're about to be good. Can they handle the bullseye or the expected success people are, are, are you know, expecting to see? out of Houston. That's my only question. I don't question much else. I mean, we saw C.J. Stroud, again, one of the purest throwers in football, no doubt about that. Great throw, a little double post concept to the left there to Tank Dell. Boom, touchdown. Uh, we got to see Daniil Hunter out there. The Texans passed the look test, let alone you really look at their team and roster and what Nick Casario and D'Amico Ryans have done. They got good players that fit their scheme and how they want to play, and that usually lines up to be being successful in the NFL. Excuse me. I'm burping up my coffee. But, yeah, I do believe the type around the Texans. I do. I think they're coached well, the talent's real, and the quarterback's real. The Colts, Anthony Richardson, quick hitters. Again, I love Anthony Richardson's physical ability. He just got to play more, right? You know, that's the big thing. I saw in the game uh, against the Broncos – you know, he threw a ball down the middle, should have been intercepted, probably should have been a pick six, seeing the field, right? That's the big thing with Anthony Richardson. It's the big thing that jumped out to me when I went back for my quarterback rankings is, yeah, there's some awesome plays and we see the physical talent, but a little bit like we've talked about with some other guys today. we got to be consistent, got to hit the right guy, got to hit the right guy on time, hit, the, hit him with the appropriate throw. You know, almost throws an interception down the middle. Had a shallow cross on the third down that he was way late getting to that should have been an easy first down, right? So it's, again, he's another guy. It's a big year for him. I love the way he looks and everything like that. And I know he's a football junkie, but I think it's just about him playing, getting the reps, getting comfortable seeing the field, and then he'll be able to utilize all the tricks and great offense Shane Steichen can supply for him there in Indianapolis with that offense. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. That uh, Anthony Richardson, definitely one of the, to me, top five, top ten guys I have my eyes on through training camp and into the preseason here because, hey, the Colts I do think are a good football team, and if he can play at a high level, they could be a real pain in the butt in the AFC. Titans, Will Levis playing, right? Still a little crazy 
with taking some shots and doing all that, but I love Will Levis's intensity and fire. Hey, his throwing motion is a little wacky. There's no doubt about it, but he's got real power on his arm. Titans are another team. You, know, you saw the starters in there. They were playing, right, getting some reps. I thought Calvin Ridley, just some quick things that popped out to me about that. You know, Calvin Ridley – looked like he had another gear that I didn't see in Jacksonville. And I think that's when, hey, you, you miss a year of football, you get back that first year, hey, we know he was good last year, but I don't think he was at full capacity of what Calvin Ridley could be. I think this year you see a different guy, a guy that really has a chance to be a superstar at receiver and make special things like, like we saw in the game. Catch a little ball over the middle, make somebody miss, run up the sidelines for 30 yards, right? He's that special that way. I like a few things that I saw with the Titans too that I got to hit on. Tony Pollard, how can you not be encouraged by that? He looks like he's totally back from that broken fibula that he kind of was repairing from and healing from last year, but he looked great. And the backup running back, Ty J. Spears, I thought was another one that looked really good. They got an impressive one-two punch there uh, in Tennessee. They get they get DeAndre Hopkins back healthy, and you couple him with Calvin Ridley and what I think where Will Levis is on the up and up. Tennessee, again, I'm not saying Super Bowl type of team or anything like that, but I think a team that I look at to go, I don't even know if I look at them as a playoff team, but a team that could be a thorn in the side, upset some teams' playoff chances, and win some unexpected games because they got some splash players at some key positions in the uh, for their football team. The Jaguars, Trevor Lawrence, you saw again the Kansas City Chiefs effect. They played, their starters played. Trevor Lawrence looked good. And what, I'll tell you, Trevor Lawrence, check him out. Motion was smoother, right? I talked about it in my quarterback rankings. His physical ability is off the charts. This is as good as anybody in football, right? Sometimes seeing the field, sometimes not having this real fast herky-jerky throwing motion that he can get to at times. It causes him to be off target with the football. So – and throwing the appropriate football. Those are the things we talked about during my quarterback rankings where I'd go, damn, it, the guy's seven yards down the field. He threw the ball to him like he was 50 yards away. He threw it so hard the guy couldn't catch it. I saw appropriate pace on the ball on, on Saturday night. That's what I liked. I saw him throw a backside in cut. I think it was to Gabe Davis where I went, ooh, last year Trevor Lawrence would have thrown that ball so hard it might have stuck in his face mask. This year it was nice and smooth. The motion was one speed, and the ball was appropriate. So that was good to see from the Jaguars. And the Jaguars, as we know, got some talent. They got to bounce back from last year. They were a banged-up football team. Another team, too, with an incredible – one-two punch, I think, at running back. We know ATN's good, but Tank's, Tank Bigsby looked really good to where they're going to they're gonna be able to use him in, in, in a bell cow manner as well. I mean, he can make some big plays, right? He's rocked up, strong as hell, you know, coming out of East Auburn, right, Pete, if I remember correctly? But, uh, yeah, I think he's got some big play ability, and we got to see the circus catch by Brian Thomas Jr. as well in Jacksonville. Jacksonville's got some, uh, got some talent. There's no doubt about it. Um, thought the Braylon Trice injury for the Falcons, the the pass rusher the out of Washington, right? I thought that was a big blow to their football team. They're not necessarily deep at pass rusher. I think it's one of the things on the team you talk about where you go, wait, that's one area they could be a little more impressive. They got good players, but is there splash players? Is there a guy that can come around the edge and get a strip sack in a big moment? Not having Braylon Trice, that stinks for him and the Falcons, so I was sorry to hear that. And then – the Raiders. The Raiders, last thing on them. All right. And we got uh, at John Isaac 5'5. Five, five. Gardner Minshew looked pretty good. Yes, he did. And so did Aiden O'Connell. I thought they both looked good. Right. They got a, that's, that's a, that is one, another one that is a true battle right now in the NFL. You rarely have a true battle. Right. I don't know where that's going to go. Gardner Minshew has great feel. There's no doubt about that. He moves well in the pocket. But as I always say, Gardner Minshew, there's always a few throws every game. I look at it and go, ah, I wish he would have thrown that better or done this or done that. Aiden O'Connell looked really good too. Aiden O'Connell, the one thing I'll say here is he might not be as sexy as Gardner Minshew, but he is big. He plays big in the pocket. He's unaffected by people around him, and he can push the ball down the field 
with people around him and not needing a lot of space to step into the ball or get his whole body in the ball to throw a ball 15 or 20 yards down the field. That's what I like about Aiden O'Connell. And as we know, you know, unless you're a great mover, yeah, you got to be able to throw with people around you and the pocket collapsing. And I do think he has an advantage over Gardner Minshew there. I thought they both looked really good. I was actually very impressed with Aiden O'Connell. But that's going to be interesting. And I think we heard Antonio Pierce say he'd like to make a quarterback decision after next week's preseason game. Be interested to see where that goes. I, I would guess Gardner Minshew starts the next one, and then Aiden O'Connell will be the second guy in, uh, which was vice versa of what we saw uh, this past weekend. All right? I think those, again, I told you, I mean, if you didn't play starters or do any of that, you didn't, you're not going to get a whole lot of talk here, okay? We're not here going to talk about every. We talked about the teams that played players, and we got to see a little bit of a picture of what they might look like in the regular season. And, of course, we hit on the, on the uh, rookie quarterbacks, which to me was, was the weekend. They were the stars of the show this weekend. It was awesome to see. Um, all right, everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed that solo dolo pod that I just brought to the – that was not easy, uh, but I did it, got it done. You know where to find us. Subscribe, rate, and review. Thank God Connor Rogers will be here on Wednesday to save me. He can host the show so then I can just be an asshole who talks and says a lot of crazy shit. All right, that's when I'm at my best. But I hope everybody enjoyed that little rundown of preseason week one, things that popped out to Sims, all right, and what I saw. Let's get ready, baby. Football's here. We got week two of the preseason. Keep the questions coming in. Anything, I'm going to continue to dive through film. I know there's other rookies at other positions I haven't seen scene i'd want to see a little bit i got questions about certain guys and i just i want to see a little bit more of a a, a focused look before i throw out things here you know through the microphone into the uh, internet universe here to people hold me accountable but hope everybody liked it glad to be back hope you guys are happy to be back football school everything's coming around the corner i get a little whiff of fall in the air every now and then All right, everybody be good. Enjoy the next two days. We'll see you Wednesday. Me and Connor Rogers back at it Wednesday. Chris Sims on button. Be cool. See you there. Peace out. Yo, 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 what's up? Thanks for watching, homies. You know it's the off-season, but there's no off-season with Chris Sims on Button. Where it's the NFL. It goes all year around. All right. So hit subscribe, please, to hear my thoughts on your favorite team, your favorite quarterback, and hey, how this season might unfold as we get ready for the 2024 season. We got a better picture, clearer look now. Now that the draft is over, free agency. We know who's playing quarterback for certain teams. So again, thanks for watching and remember to subscribe. Peace out, homies. Check you out soon.